Welcome to our Croeso Norwood course, Ichi Geed. This week we have completed the sixth review of the coronavirus regulations here in Wales. As usual, we have carefully examined the latest scientific and medical evidence about coronavirus to see if we can relax the restrictions further and how much headroom we may have to make changes. And at the same time, we've looked at the situation around the world. Now, I want to begin by saying that we have only been able to lift restrictions here because of the way in which everyone has worked together to reduce the spread of coronavirus. When we have asked you to, you have stayed at home. When we have asked you to, you have stayed local. And together, we have been able to keep Wales safe. The result is that the virus continues to be in decline in Wales and we can once again carefully and cautiously go on step by step lifting the lockdown. But as I always say, coronavirus has not gone away. This pandemic will not be over by Christmas. And that is why it is so important that we all go on protecting one another from the virus, keeping our distance from other people, washing our hands often, wearing a face covering when on public transport. I'm now going to provide a summary of the changes we will be making over the next three week cycle. And we'll do so once again in a phased way over those three weeks. The majority of the headroom we have will be used to relax the restrictions on people meeting each other, to make life easier for family and for friends. So I'll take each week in turn. In week one, the first week of the three week cycle, from August the 3rd, from Monday, pubs, bars, restaurants and cafes will be able to reopen indoors. Licensed wedding venues will be able to reopen to carry out ceremonies but indoor reception parties will not be considered until the 15th of August, the start of the third week at the earliest. As from Monday, we will relax the restrictions to provide more flexibility in the way people can meet outdoors, while reminding everyone that physical distancing still needs to be maintained at all times. And we will also update our guidance to make it clear that children under 11 will not now need to maintain a two metre distance from one another or from adults. The scientific advice shows that the risk of transmission is lower amongst this age group and it will mean that young children can meet their friends to play out of doors or to give their grandparents a hug again. Now from the second week, from week two, if conditions remain favourable, then from the 10th of August onwards, swimming pools, indoor fitness studios, gyms, spas and indoor leisure centres will be able to reopen in Wales, as will children's indoor play areas. That takes us to the third week of the current cycle and we continue to explore whether we can make changes to the rules on meeting people indoors from August the 15th. Now we would like to be able to offer more chances for family and friends to meet together indoors, but this is one of the most difficult areas from a public health perspective, because as people have more contact with one another indoors, the risk of transmission increases. More than half of the cases are contact tracers identified in July in North Wales were linked to household contacts. And today we have seen indoor meetings curtailed in Greater Manchester, East Lancashire and parts of West Yorkshire following a spike in coronavirus cases there too. And all of this is bound to give us pause for thought. Our step-by-step -step approach in Wales allows us to 
to weigh up the evidence for every change we make, and we will go on doing that for indoor meetings over the next two weeks to see what we may be able to do from the 15th of August onwards. So as you can see, we are moving into the green phase of our traffic light system. And as we do so, it becomes even more important that we all follow the new ways of working and behaving. We all need to adapt to the changes, whether it's booking an appointment, whether it's giving our contact details to support our test, trace, protect system, or whether that is complying with physical distancing and strict cleaning regimes. I want once again to thank all those businesses who have worked with us and are complying with a guidance to work in a COVID compliant way. You are helping to reduce the spread of the virus and to protect people, ensuring we can go on lifting restrictions in the future. But I also want to say that a small minority, whether they are people or businesses, are not doing as is required. And we will take action to enforce the rules here in Wales. Ignoring the guidance cannot be an option. We have legal powers which allow us and others to take action if some people's behaviour becomes a threat to other people's health. Now we are working with our local authorities, with environmental health officers, with the national park authorities and with the police to ensure that the measures to keep us all safe are properly complied with. We will change the regulations to enhance local authorities' environmental health protection powers. This will be used to ensure that premises are complying with the reopening requirements. And we will act on intelligence reported to the Wales TUC, who every week compile information from frontline workers about the way in which the rules are being observed here in Wales. We are doing that because coronavirus has not gone away. We, each of us, each one of us, have a responsibility to keep Wales safe. Diolch fawr. Happy as ever to turn to some questions. And the first questions today come from James Williams of BBC Wales. Now, Dad, Jochen Vauer, um, can I start with uh, the situation in North uh, England and um, your take on it, really, and whether you're particularly concerned about the the rise in cases there? Can you tell us a little bit about your your meeting with the Prime Minister this morning? What was discussed there, and also the Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has strongly advised people in Scotland from visiting those areas in England and from the people in those areas in England to visit Scotland. What's your advice? Uh, James. Uh, so I think anybody would be right to be concerned at the evidence we are seeing in other parts of Europe, in other parts of the world and across our border of the way in which coronavirus can begin to circulate and spread uh, again. So of course we keep a careful watch on all of that and we discussed all of that with the Prime Minister this morning. He outlined the additional measures which are being put in place in the north of England which by and large brings the position there into line with the position that we already have here uh, in Wales. And we did the thing which I always find useful which is to share information about the way in which the virus is circulating in different parts of the United Kingdom and how we are all responding to it. Uh, my uh, advice to people who travel across our very permeable border, travelling into England and into Wales, is simply this, that if you come to Wales, please help us to keep Wales safe. We welcome people from other parts of the United Kingdom to Wales, and we ask people to take all those actions that we know and you know 
help to keep yourself safe, your family safe and others too. Maintain a social distance, make sure you wash your hands. If you're using shared facilities, do so carefully and consciously because in that way we can go on keeping Wales safe and open for everybody to enjoy. So just to clarify, you, you're advising against those trips or, or saying that they just have to ha they could happen with them um, as long as people continue social distance? Uh, our advice is if people make those trips to make sure that they abide by the guidance we have in Wales because that way those trips can continue and people can keep each other and other people properly safe. Okay, and can I just pick up on compliance since you mentioned it in your uh, opening statement? Is that because you're concerned that businesses are not complying and um, and with regards to sort of people meeting outdoors, are, are you kind of catching up with the public there? Well, if my trip in Cardiff Park last night is anything to go by, it seems that a lot of people are already doing those kind of things anyway. Well, on compliance, we've got a few weeks now of evidence of us reopening the tourism and hospitality industries. Uh, and just to say that, you know, I am hugely impressed by the efforts that I see individual businesses are uh, making to make sure that their premises are properly safe and secure as far as coronavirus is concerned. And we want to support those businesses that are doing the right thing. They're putting time, energy, money, no doubt, into making their premises safe for people to visit. And one of the ways we can support those businesses is to take more decisive action in that small minority of cases where it is clear that those things are not being done. And that's why we will strengthen the enforcement powers of local authorities to be able to take quick and decisive action where we come across instances of people not being prepared to abide by the rules that we have agreed with that sector. These are rules that we have drawn up in consultation with those people who represent those businesses. And we expect all businesses to comply with the advice that, have been, that has been given. Uh, and as for uh, outdoors, we've said all along, our Chief Medical Officer have been very clear all along that we should take advantage of the outdoors during this time of the year when it is so much safer uh, to be out of doors. Uh, and our regulations will allow greater uh, flexibility. Uh, and uh, I look to people in Wales to go on doing the things that I think people do, to think carefully, to abide by the regulations and to take advantage of the way in which people can get together safely, particularly in the outdoors. James Duke Mawr, across to Owain, Owain Phillips at ITV Wales. Uh, Pramda, um, first Minister, can I ask in terms of the reviewing of these rules, you do it regularly, yes, but is there a risk here that people get confused, quite frankly, as the rules change quite regularly what they can and can't do? Well, we're obliged by the law, oh, and that's what the law requires, is that we review the regulations every three weeks. Uh, and I think people in Wales have got quite used to that three-week rhythm. They know that every three weeks I turn up here on a Friday and explain the latest position. And I think people in Wales are used to the fact that we change our regulations in this step-by-step -step way. Uh, I know that it means people have got to keep up with the changing picture, uh, but on the whole, I think people are used to doing that and are comfortable with it because they can see that in Wales, we change the regulations when it is safe for us to do so. And that when it is safe, we return freedoms to people that they've had to give up in order to protect one another during the onset of the crisis. And on um, the northwest of England and the links with North Wales, are travel restrictions being considered at all there? Well, not directly as travel restrictions in their own right. We continue to be willing, were the facts to justify it, to think about local lockdowns where there are flare-ups with cons considerable community transmission. Uh, and if we were to require local lockdowns in Wales, then stay local might become part of the message that we would require in a local lockdown set of circumstances. So travel restrictions in that sense are still part of the repertoire that we could draw on, but they would be targeted to where we think they would be necessary and part of a wider package of measures. 
Oh, I'm dear, over to Will Haywood at Wales Online. Thank you, First Minister. You have talked about strengthening enforcement rules. and You only have to travel on public transport in Wales to realise that people are not following the rules on masks. Can you explain to us exactly what officials will be able to do now to enforce these rules that they weren't able to do before? Uh, well, the sort of powers that we intend to provide to local uh, environmental health officers, for example, would be to be able to issue a prohibition notice or a suspended prohibition notice, which would mean, for example, that you might go to a premises, find that it is not doing the things uh, that are required of them, and say to that premise, you've now got five days in which to make sure that you bring yourselves in line. There's a suspended prohibition notice, and if I come back in five days' time and things haven't been put right, then this premise could be closed. So these are significant powers, uh, and they will, uh, I think, the fact that they exist and the fact that they may need to be used will send a powerful message to those people who think that the advice is there for others and not for them. It's there for us all. Thank you. Um, if there were to be a general rise in coronavirus across Wales, what restrictions would you look to impose first? Um, can you ensure parents that you will prioritise children returning to school? And if I may, uh, you, uh, uh, Wales and England are drawing from broadly the same evidence to make decisions. Given the recent rises in England, do you think that the UK government has been irresponsible in how they have lifted the lockdown? Well, as I said in answer to an earlier question, well, our focus is on dealing with local uh, growths in coronavirus were that to take place. And at the moment, we don't uh, expect the need to reimpose lockdown restrictions on a Wales-wide basis. But in any local restrictions that we may need to put in place, then you're right to say uh, that children and the urgent need for children to be able to return to school will always be amongst the primary uh, considerations that we would bear in mind, particularly as we have learned more about the way in which this virus doesn't have the same dramatic impact on young children and they don't circulate it to other people in the way that adults uh, do. So uh, to confirm uh, the needs of children, the needs to resume school will always be very high on our uh, agenda. I, I never use these occasions to criticise others. Uh, I simply say that the way that the United Kingdom operates is that we are a voluntary association of four nations and that each nation has the ability to make the rules that best reflect their own needs uh, and circumstances. That's what we try and do for Wales, and that's what I'm sure others try to do in discharging their own responsibilities. Across to Dan, Dan Bevan at LBC. Thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon. Going back to the situation in the north of England, if you don't mind, are you worried about the spike of cases there due to the proximity of the population in North Wales, especially since there's been a spike in cases there as well. Are we heading towards a different set of rules for North Wales and South Wales because of the proximity to that North England population? Well, as I said, every one of us would be concerned at what we have seen, not simply uh, in the North of England, but what we've seen in Spain, what we've seen in Luxembourg, what we've seen in other parts of the world. This is a virus when you can go from a position, as we are in Wales today, where the virus is at its lowest ebb and still declining, and in a very short number of weeks, that position can be transformed. So nobody should think uh, that we are immune from some of the difficulties that others are experiencing. Now, it was good to be able to discuss with the Prime Minister this morning the position in the north of England, the precautionary measures, that are now being taken there. As I say, in many ways, it simply puts the north of England into the position we are in Wales today as a result of the way we have gone about uh, things. I don't anticipate, uh, in a blanket way, a different regime for the whole of the north of Wales and a different regime for the south of Wales. If there are local flare-ups in the south or in the north, we will mobilise our public health effort, our test, trace, protect system, in order to bear down on those local outbreaks, as we have shown we can do successfully in Anglesey and in Merthyr Tydfil over recent weeks. 
Thank you. And would you be prepared to lock down any part of Wales that sees a spike in coronavirus cases with just a few hours notice? And if you wouldn't, what is the right amount of time to give before putting an area into local lockdown? Well, Dan, our approach throughout coronavirus has been to plan first and announce second, uh, rather than to make an announcement and then uh, scramble to try and uh, work out exactly what that announcement means. Now, in an emergency, that is difficult. But what we try to do is to use all the surveillance intelligence we have. So every single day, we watch things like the number of new cases, uh, the number of hospital admissions, the number of tests we are carrying out, which uh, turn out to be positive, the information we get from the Zoe app that is used through King's College, the new wastewater surveillance that we're carrying out in Wales. So we use every day the widest range of information we can to get the longest sight line we can manage on any local outbreaks. And if we succeed in doing that, then we would be able to give people longer notice than just a few hours. But that may not always be possible. And if you genuinely face a sudden and urgent need to act, then we would act in that way here in Wales as well. Thanks very much, uh, Dan. Go to Mark Hutchins at Five Live. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, you uh, refer to a small minority of people who aren't abiding by the rules. Um, from what I've seen, it's quite a large, small minority of people who seem to have given up on social distancing, and you can probably expect some large gatherings in the sunshine uh, this evening. Should you not have acted earlier to get tough uh, with those people? And given that so many people have given up on social distancing, doesn't it make a stronger case uh, for more um, compulsory face coverings uh, in wider settings? Uh, well, I don't think I entirely agree with your assessment of the position. Mark, it is perfectly possible to have quite a large number of people in a large park in Cardiff, for example, still observing social distancing. So uh, I don't think just the fact that there's a large number of people means that people are not behaving in the right way. But I'm very happy to repeat the message that I've given this morning, that despite the fact that coronavirus continues to fall in Wales, none of that is a reason for people not to go on doing all the right things. And the right things are the simple things, and it's because people in Wales have shown such a willingness to stick with this difficult journey that we are still today in Wales being able to go on reopening our economy and finding new opportunities for friends and families to meet while those opportunities are being closed down in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think it's a bit of a paradoxical argument, if I could put it that way, to say that because people are not abiding, as you would uh, have it with one set of rules, the answer is to provide a different set of rules. If they're not provide uh, abiding by the one, what confidence would you have that they would abide by the next lot? And you refer to transmission uh, indoors, and that's uh, part of the explanation for the delay in having extra households indoors. Of course, people can go outdoors at the moment, uh, into the sunshine, but those summer weeks are um, edging away. Um, doesn't that paint a rather gloomy picture of what uh, lies in store for us in the autumn? Well, uh, thank you. That, that is a point that does uh, concern us, and we, we debate all the time. Uh, you're right. You know, the, the summer weeks are going through our fingers. We still have the whole of August, and with a bit of luck, most of September, in which people will be able to enjoy the outdoors. And part of the reason for relaxing some of those uh, restrictions today is to allow people to make more use of that time while we can. Uh, we'll then have to assess in the autumn when we know we are heading into the time of year, the cold, the dark, the damp, all those conditions that coronavirus thrives in. And it will then be incumbent on us all when we aren't able to be outside as much to behave inside in a way that mitigates the additional risks that we will all be facing. Thank you. Over to Rob Taylor at Wrexham.com. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, people are obviously very concerned locally with reference by the CMO and a minister this week to community, tr community transmission in Wrexham. Two outbreak control teams at work and mobile testing also rolled out. You've said there won't be a local lockdown for Wrexham and today's easements will also will apply for Wrexham. Can you give your understanding of the depth of the issue in Wrexham, what trends you're seeing? And with the news last night regarding Manchester and East Lancashire, 
where is Wrexham in context to those places? Thank you very much, uh, Rob. So our assessment of the position in Wrexham is, is that the outbreaks uh, are essentially uh, situation specific. So we've been dealing for several uh, weeks with the Rowan Foods outbreak. We believe that is well under uh, control. We have a, uh, another setting at the Wrexham Myler Hospital. The health minister and I both met with uh, senior staff at that site yesterday to hear about all the measures they are taking to bring uh, that uh, situation back under control. We're doing more community testing to see whether there has been outward transmission into the community from those two sites. Uh, at the moment, the evidence is, I think, that things are stable. There are more cases each day, but the number of new cases is not going up. Now, we will continue to monitor carefully, to watch that situation, to see the results of the tests uh, as they come back. And if that situation changes, uh, then of course, uh, we will take action uh, in response to it. Uh, the positivity rate uh, at Wrexham would put it in the middle of uh, the table right across England, not at the top end of the English uh, table. And that's another reason why we feel that we are able to go on offering the wider public of Wrexham the same freedoms as are going to be available to the rest of Wales. But I do want just to give an assurance to people who live in that part of Wales that we watch every day with all the expertise that we can muster the position in Wrexham. We think that it is stable and where there have been outbreaks in particular places, they are under control. If that were to alter, uh, then we would take the necessary action. Thank you. And we've been asking for local Wrexham specific data, uh, but it's been given out on a health board level. That changed on Monday when the U-turn took place and Wrexham Mile Hospital specific information was given out. Uh, we've had local leaks and social media posts by members of the Senate at times, which have been better sources of information in the official channels. Can you give a clear message to those working in health in Wales that information should be open, timely and transparent? And you reference data you're seeing daily regarding Wrexham. Will you make that public as well quickly? Uh, well, the uh, information that we see is made public through the outbreak control team. I believe that they will be making a further public statement this afternoon and that they will be providing further Wrexham specific uh, figures and information in the statement that they will publish. And uh, yes, I'm happy to repeat that I think that information needs to be provided to people in Wales uh, in a timely way and in a way that people can understand and can be explained so that people draw informed conclusions and that's the way that we will go on responding to the current position in Wrexham. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I'm going to go to Gareth, Gareth Wynne Williams of the Local Democracy Reporting Service. Um, the North Wales MP has today questioned the lack of leisure travel restrictions from outbreak areas in the northwest of England, uh, arguing that it'll directly result in people travelling to holiday homes in Wales as well as more visitors to the area generally, uh, placing even more strain on health and public services. Uh, with North Wales in particular receiving the bulk of its visitors from these areas, could and would travel restrictions be policed on the border? And what would your advice be for both visitors and the communities here that serve them? Well, dear Paul, uh, Gareth, first of all, to say that I do understand uh, the anxieties that lie behind the question uh, that you have posed. Our border is very permeable. People travel in both directions. Large numbers of people who live in Wales, work in England and cross that border in that direction every day, just as people come from England to work uh, in Wales. So my focus is not on closing borders, it's about making that safe. And we have put lots of things in place in Wales to make sure that as people come to visit Wales, the information that they get, the settings that they visit, the experiences that they will have, that all those things have been made safe for them and for others. So we look to businesses to make sure that they put in place all the things we have agreed with them. And then we say to individuals who come to Wales, 
help us to keep Wales safe. And we give them very clear information about how they can do that. And I think the evidence to date is that people are very respectful uh, of that. And provided people are, we look forward to going on working people to Wales. Perhaps more widely, uh, the leader of Gwynedd Council has today called for a mature and open debate on the future of tourism, um, citing the present cost it, um, it incurs on public services. Um, the current situation, especially in the light of scenes recently in Snowdonia, has been described by many as over-tourism. Now, claiming that more of the same is not acceptable, he says that COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to look again at how we manage the tourist industry, which has an impact on our countryside and leading the push for perhaps a more diverse economy. How would you respond to this? Uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy to um, support the call for a mature debate about the future of the industry in Wales. We need a sustainable tourism industry uh, in Wales uh, and we need an industry that is capable of thriving and offering livelihoods to people in those parts of Wales where tourism is such an important part of local economies. So uh, I agree with uh, the leader of Gwynedd that coronavirus provides us with a moment when we should have that uh, debate. Uh, I myself uh, in the past have taken uh, debates on the floor of the Senate about a tourism tax, for example, something seen in many, many parts of Europe where people who come into an area make a small contribution uh, as part of their stay, and that small contribution, along with others, provides a pot of money that local communities can provide the facilities that make those places go on being attractive to visitors uh, in the future. So uh, a debate about the sort of tourism we want, how we make it sustainable, how we distribute the costs that are involved in making that industry uh, sustainable seems a very good idea uh, to me and now is a good moment to, to have it. Gareth, dear uh, over to Tom, Tom Magnet, Carers World Radio. Thank you very much indeed, First Minister. Can I turn to the issue of shielding? Unless I missed it in your earlier uh, reminder of dates, um, you're still planning to pause shielding on the 16th of August. One of our English viewers has expressed a sentiment that, uh, across all four home nations, including Wales, of what it feels like, uh, the impending end of shielding. She says, I'm terrified. I see images of people not wearing masks where they should do. I see people not socially distancing and I'm being encouraged to go back to work. I'd rather lose my job than my life. Uh, can you first confirm that you still intend to pause shielding on the 16th of August? And whatever the science, wouldn't it be wiser to defer the end of shielding, for example, into September? Well, Tom, currently the 16th of August is the date that we intend to pause the shielding scheme. That is the advice from our chief medical officer. Uh, and people's views about it are mixed, aren't they? Just as I have had letters from people anxious about the end of shielding. I have had messages from people telling me how much they are looking forward to being able to resume parts uh, of life that have been denied to them and uh, focusing on the impact on people's mental health and well-being from being asked to shield continuously. Uh, I think my message to the person who, who you uh, quoted is to be clear that in Wales uh, this is advice to people. It's not an instruction to people to leave their homes and to do things that they don't feel safe in doing. And we have been uh, in good conversations with our local authorities over the last couple of weeks to make sure that if there are people after the 16th of August who still need help with shopping, who still need help with collecting medicines and so on, that will still be available to them in Wales, while not denying to other people who feel more confident and more willing, the ability now to resume those parts of their own lives for themselves. Um, one of the um, issues with people shielding, I've spoken to quite a number over the course of the past few months, and they feel a social pressure. I, I accept that you say it's not an instruction, that, that it's a choice, an individual choice. Uh, but given that, the fear is the risk of bringing COVID-19 into the house 
that they fended it off for four months or so. So don't you think that although you say your action has to be proportionate and the virus hasn't gone away, do you not think that, that there should be some response to this social pressure? Uh, well, I, I would be very disappointed. I'm sorry to hear that people feel that there is some sort of social pressure on people to give up the shielding regime. That's not how we want it to be in Wales. We want to offer people the ability where they feel confident and able to resume parts of their lives to know that the advice in Wales is, it is safe for them to do so. Because as I said, Tom, the virus in Wales is at its lowest ebb. If we don't allow people to do those things now, and if we face, as Mark Hutchins said to me, a difficult autumn, then those people may not get that break out of that regime at all. But where people don't feel that it's right for them, we want to go on supporting them in making more precautionary decisions because that's how they feel their own lives are best led. Thanks, Tom. To Andrew Natal at the leader. Thank you, Minister. Um, so we've obviously heard all the new announcements with regards to the restrictions being changed. Um, but obviously, we, here in Wrexham, we have had obviously the localised issues and the spikes. Where were where were where was Wrexham in your um, considerations when making these decisions? Was it a talking point, or was it uh, any sort of factor at all in making the decisions? No, absolutely, we've had. Uh long discussions about Wrexham over the last uh, few days, both in terms of meeting on the local spikes uh, and the actions that have been taken there, and a very specific discussion about whether the additional uh, lifting of the restrictions that we're announcing for the rest of Wales should be uh, denied to people in Wrexham because of the situation there. So, you know, I can absolutely assure uh, you and your readers uh, that we have focused on Wrexham throughout the whole uh, discussion. Um, in the end, uh, the data that we are seeing is that the position in Wrexham is stable and in the two outbreak sites is under control. And in those circumstances, it didn't seem proportionate to deny to the wider population of Wrexham things that other pe people in Wales will be able to enjoy. But it was a conscious decision not something we just sort of stumbled into. And secondly, um, gyms and exercise facilities have been included in the new restrictions being eased. Um, but we've spoken to a few local gyms only this morning to get their reaction to the news. And some have obviously welcomed the news that they're able to reopen after months behind closed doors. Um, but some have said that this um, has come too late and say that they feel that they've not had the proper support um, to maintain themselves throughout the virus closures. I think some independent gyms that we've spoken to have had to dip into savings and um, there's other situations where some may potentially for another month or two may not have survived the pandemic. And uh, what can you say to gyms um, who have sort of stuck with this? Um... Well, look, I, I'm immensely uh, sympathetic to all those uh, small businesses in Wales for whom coronavirus has been such an economic uh, difficulty. Uh, and it's why we've been glad over recent weeks to be able to reopen all sorts of other uh, settings. Gyms have had to come towards the end of the list because there are particular risks that have had to be mitigated. Uh, and we're very grateful for all the discussions we've had with the sector about the protections that they can put in place to reduce risks and make people feel safe to return to them uh, again. My general advice to the sector, as it has been to all, other sectors is that it is better now to focus on the things that you can do rather than things you can't do and to make the best success you can of the new opportunities that are coming your way here in Wales because by doing it in that way we will be able to create further opportunities across the tourism hospitality and leisure sectors in future. Thank you, Andrew. To Liam Randall of the Local Democracy Reporting Service. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, here in the northeast of Wales, we've heard this week about the sad case of Margaret Blaylock, a great grandmother from Connors Quay who died just six days ago after she's believed to have contracted the virus while she was staying at Wrexham Myler Hospital. 
Uh, her daughter Gail says that Margaret was failed by the local health board. And we're also aware of other patients contracting the virus while staying at the hospital. Um, given that Betsy Cadwallader has been under the highest level of Welsh Government monitoring for five years, is there anything that you'd like to say to Mrs Blaylock's family and to other families who are very concerned about the well-being of their loved ones who are staying at the Myla? Well, what I say to all those families who have lost loved ones during the pandemic, uh, for whatever reason and whatever cause, uh, that the Welsh Government has always been focused in the actions we take and doing our very best to protect you and others from this awful disease. Uh, I met yesterday with senior staff uh, at the Wrexham Myla uh, and they gave me a full account of everything they are doing to make sure that people who arrive at the hospital with coronavirus, often not knowing that they have it until they are tested in the hospital, that everything is being done for them and everything is being done to reduce the risks that people who come to the hospital without the disease don't acquire it while they are there. Individual cases, of course, have to take up their concerns, not with me, uh, but with the people who are responsible for providing the care that they have experienced, and I would certainly encourage them to do that. Um, and just following on from that, with regards to the situation in Wrexham, um, we've currently got mass testing uh, taking place in both the Kaya Park and Hightown areas. Uh, we understand that this is at least partly due to local clusters of cases in these areas. Um, despite the results from those tests not yet being fully known, from, fun, uh, from Monday up to 30 people in these locations will theoretically be able to meet outdoors. Uh, there are pubs, restaurants, cafes, an indoor bowling alley and a bingo hall, all within a stone's throw of these two areas which will be able to reopen. Um, is there not a risk that you're going to make the local situation forward? Well, we will publish the results of the tests that have been carried out in those two uh, communities beginning this afternoon with the outbreak control uh, team report, and that will give us a proper uh, evidence-based insight into the risks rather than a speculative, couldn't it be getting worse sort of uh, uh, approach to it. Uh, if the evidence were there, that reopening places in those communities would put people at risk, then of course we would take a different course of action. But we will rely on the scientific evidence. It's why we've carried out the mass testing. I think nearly 800 people will have been tested in those two communities. That will give us a real insight into whether the virus is in circulation locally and whether offering people additional freedoms would create new and unacceptable uh, risks. We don't think, from what we have been told so far, that that will be the case, but we will follow the evidence wherever it takes us and base our actions on what that evidence tells us. Sorry, just a quick follow-up on that. So have you not seen um, that evidence as yet? Well, I have seen the evidence, Liam, and you will see it once the outbreak control team make their afternoon statements in the way that they always do at two o'clock. Thank you very much to Nathan Shoesmith at the speaker. Good afternoon, First Minister. We've seen multiple changes to overseas travel advice this week. How closely is Wales in conversation with the UK about the changes being made and with the very short notice that has been provided of these changes? Have you got any particular advice for people uh, considering traveling, fearing that they might get stuck out there. Um, is your advice now to essentially avoid traveling overseas and to have a staycation? Thanks very much, Nathan. Well, look, I've always uh, said that essentially I regard this as a UK level responsibility. The Welsh Government isn't responsible for border security. We don't carry out direct discussions with uh, foreign governments. That is what the UK government does we have a fallback uh, power if we thought that what the UK government uh, was proposing was perverse then our chief medical officer would be able to uh, advise us to do something different but in the absence of that advice we follow what the UK government uh, decides in this area because they have the information they have the responsibilities uh, and we in a sense uh, act as their agent in making those regulations here uh, in Wales. Uh, my advice to people in Wales who are thinking of travelling abroad 
is just to be very careful and conscious in making those decisions. So look carefully at the location that you are intending to visit to make sure that it, you know, as far as you can, that it's somewhere where the virus is properly uh, under control. Uh, and at the same time, just to bear in mind that Wales itself is a wonderful place to go on holiday. <laughs> Thank you, First Minister. Uh, this lunchtime, a greater police presence has been pledged in England to enforce the wearing of face coverings, including in a new list of locations, including museums. Can the people of Wales expect greater enforcement of your measures? And does the scientific evidence you've seen suggest that wearing face masks in extra locations, such as in museums, galleries, places of worship, in addition to the social distancing measures already in place, could be useful? or could be necessary soon in Wales? Well, the advice uh, <clears throat> that I have seen has always been clear, uh, that if you are visiting somewhere which is crowded, then wearing a face covering is advisable. And we positively recommend to people that if they are in a crowded location, that that is what they should do. And anybody who feels comfortable or more confident in being in any place in Wales, wearing a face covering is absolutely free uh, to do so. Uh, but there is a difference between encouraging people and advising people and mandating it. And with the virus at the point that it is in Wales, at the low ebb that it currently is, then our advice has been that it is not proportionate to mandate their use. Now, if the virus began to rise again and was in more uh, virulent circulation in Wales, then of course we would revisit that advice and think again. But in current circumstances, we advise, we positively advise people to wear face coverings where they are in crowded locations. Uh, and uh, we are absolutely, of course, happy for any individual preferring to use a face covering uh, to do so. Thank you, Jeff Abbott. Oh, finally, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nathan. Uh, finally, to Jeff Abbott at Cloyd News. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, my my question is to do with um, more protection for vulnerable people in the community. If there is a second spike, and it looks like uh, there will be, is, it, is there some kind of um, early warning system that the Welsh government could uh, could send out uh, to uh, very vulnerable people uh, to let them know that this is going on in their community? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. So, as I said in answering to an earlier question. Uh, we have developed a whole range of surveillance information that gives us the earliest possible insight into whether or not the virus is beginning to pick up again uh, in Wales. And our aim is to use that surveillance information to be able to give people early warnings of where we see problems beginning to occur uh, if, we, if we do see them. And that would allow us to be able to communicate with the most vulnerable people uh, in our communities about any further restrictions that may be necessary. Uh, it won't always be possible. Sometimes things really do happen in a crisis and in an emergency and action has to be taken with very little notice. Uh, and we've seen that overnight. But the better we are at surveillance and the more information we have, the less likely it is that we will have to do things in that sort of way and the better position we will be to be able to provide people with early warnings of what may be about to follow. And my second question is um, to do with some sort of, to help with the visibility of uh, what is um, a hidden uh, vulnerability, um, as in the sunflower scheme. Um, is it, could the um, Welsh Government uh, introduce something like that? Because uh, you've said yourself, that uh, the coronavirus isn't going to won't be won't be uh, will still be with us after Christmas, and it would help uh, people with um, very low immune immune systems to uh, to um, to be recognised in the community. Um, yeah, could something like that be done? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Look, we are we are considering a number of uh, ideas that have come in to us from people wanting to run schemes of that sort and others. We are actively supporting, for example the campaign by Baroness Elora Finlay of Llandaff, one of our most uh, senior doctors in Wales, who is supporting a campaign inside the health service and beyond 
for people to wear a badge reminding other people of the importance of maintaining a social distance. So there are many ways in which uh, people can use their voluntary effort, the expertise they have, to be able to help people to stick with the rules that we have, to recognise people who may need particular consideration, but to do it in a way that doesn't single those people out so that their vulnerabilities become another source of difficulty to them. So uh, thank you for pointing to the scheme that you have today and the Welsh Government remains very open to discussing those ideas and where we're able to, uh, to help in promoting them. Thank you all very much indeed.